In this segment, we're going to dig more deeply into that stretching and folding business. We first encountered this notion in the context of Smale's horseshoe, which is a map of the unit square onto itself. Here's how this map works. It takes the unit square and then stretches it out, keeping the volume the same, and then folds it over on top of itself, like this. One of the important things about this map is that it takes points that are far away and brings them close together. It also takes points that are close together and moves them far apart. Now that you know about stable and unstable manifolds, you can imagine how and why this happens. For the stretching step, for instance, you could imagine this being the effect of a stable manifold transverse to the skinny direction and an unstable manifold along the skinny direction. That isn't quite right, by the way. The way I've drawn that is only correct if the square stretches out continuously in time, like that. And that's not how a map works. The action of a map is all at once, from the unit square to the unit square. You can't kind of stop in the middle of that process and look at what's going on. We do that when we draw the Smales Horseshoe map with that midway step, just to show you what's going on. The logistic map does the same kind of thing to the unit interval, by the way, and the cobweb plot brings that out. Imagine starting a whole ribbon of initial conditions on the horizontal axis, and watching how that ribbon changes shape as all of those initial conditions bounce off the curve. This end of the ribbon will go there, and the other end of the ribbon will go there, and these two points are the end of the ribbon after one iteration, and you'll notice it's gotten reflected. Here's another example I showed you. This one is a three-dimensional map. What this top left picture is showing you is the dough before any kneading operations have been performed. This is after one entire kneading operation, this is after two, and so on and so forth. As in the snail horseshoe, there's a whole series of actions that you make with your hands that comprise this atomic kneading map. That is the operation that happens between these shots. You have to push the dough out and then fold it and then gather it together. Now the word atomic means you can't take it apart. But actually, in the case of the dough, we can. Imagine if you had a video camera pointed at the dough as you kneaded it. A video camera that could penetrate the surface and show you the path of every little piece of dough in continuous time. Then it would be completely accurate to think about and track the actions of the stable and unstable manifolds that govern that process. Of course, that's technically impossible. Even particle image velocimetry systems, PIV systems, which take pictures of tracer particles every nth of a second and then reconstruct the velocity field, can't track the velocity at every single point in a flow. And of course, it's very hard to see inside bread dough, but Dr. Brown did do a bit of tracking here. What she did was put colored beads in the dough and then track where they went at each iterate of the map. The plexiglass that you're seeing here is part of the apparatus that Dr. Brown built to make the kneading operation as repeatable as possible. Another thought experiment. What happens to a whole ball of initial conditions around one of the unstable fixed points in the pendulum? That is, what if we dropped initial conditions at every single point in that solid ball and watched what happened as time went forward? I've drawn in the arrows here to show the directions of the stable and unstable manifolds. Now the unstable manifolds are going to stretch that ball, and the stable manifolds are going to compress it, so it's going to turn into an ellipse. Here's the situation a little bit later. The ellipse is longer along this unstable manifold and thinner along the stable manifold. If you ran time backwards, the ball would deform in the opposite directions, like that, instead. If you ran time forwards a long way, the blue ball would actually deform along the unstable manifold and head towards that fixed point at minus pi. The same thing is true if you ran time backwards far enough. The blue ball would deform along the stable manifold and head towards the fixed point at minus pi. And if you go far enough forwards and backwards that those two prongs overlap at that next fixed point, things get very interesting. Indeed, that's formally equivalent to a generalized version of the snail horseshoe, and the existence of horseshoes lets you actually prove that a system is chaotic. I'm not going to go there in this course. If you're interested, look up Melnikov's method. 
but I'd like everyone to understand this progression of pictures and be aware that this particular structure has implications far beyond its geometry. This notion of the dynamical system operating on the state space is one of the most powerful ideas we have in dynamical systems. So, a couple more thought experiments. Imagine starting a whole bunch of initial conditions around the stable fixed point of the damped pendulum, and then letting time advance forwards and watching where they all go. After one time click, this one will be there, that one will be there, that one will be there, and so on and so forth. After one more time click, you'll see them go further. All of them are eventually going to spiral into the fixed points. The series of pictures I just drew for the ball of points around the unstable fixed point of the undamped pendulum was a similar thought experiment. In both cases, what you're doing with that thought experiment is visualizing the action of the dynamics on the fabric of the state space. In this situation, that fabric is getting twirled around and shrunk like it's going down a drain. If there were no swirling, that is, if every trajectory went directly towards the fixed point, it would be more like the fabric were being pulled straight down through a hole. This dynamics deforming the state space idea makes it easy to formalize the definition of dissipation. Dissipation happens when state space shrinks. And the connection between dissipation and attractors falls out of this nicely as well. In order for attractors to exist, state space action has to be a contraction. And that's formalized in Liouville's theorem. By the way, in some fields, people define dissipation as shrinking or growing. In this course, I'm restricting it to only shrinking, since that's the given in Liouville's theorem and the necessary conditions for the existence of attractors. Look back at this picture from Unit 3 and repeat that thought experiment, sprinkling initial conditions all over the basin, W, and watching the whole flock of them as time goes forward. It would be like a balloon contracting down onto the attractor. And as an aside for the topologists in the crowd, basins of attraction and flows are connected sets, and this tells you why. They're also compact sets. What about a ball of initial conditions around a fixed point that has two unstable manifolds? Initially, that ball will expand, staying a ball, but then it will deform along the manifolds in both directions into a strange shape that's governed by the geometry of those manifolds and the size of the Lyapunov exponents that parameterize growth along them. And that's exactly where we're going. Lyapunov exponents, what they are, that's the next segment, and how to calculate them, which will be in the next couple of units.